Welcome to the Roth Show. Summer between 78 and 79, apartheid in South Africa is at its peak. Lots and lots of conflict. They just built Sun City Resort. I think Frank Sinatra decided to go there, but he reflects old school Reagan type Nixon sort of politics. He's really right wing. He's not hip at that point in time. People are really, really avoiding the country because the white vote there is really, really Afrikaner is super, super racist at that point. The government is super, super exclusionary restrictive. And I said to Alex Van Halen, drummer of the band Van Halen, hey, why don't we get on a plane and go visit and take a look for ourselves? And we did. Flew LA, New York, New York, London, London, Nairobi. Got off the plane for a little layover in Nairobi and sent a telegram. Remember this day and age, you got to go, stop, stop. And uh, sent something to Tom Rafino, who was the director of International at Warner Brothers at the time, saying that we'd been taken off the plane and held captive for ransom. And how much money would Warner Brothers pony up to get us back? And did no clue that this was being fake or that we were doing a practical joke. An hour later, we got a telegram saying that Warner Brothers had taken up a collection and had collected $11.23 American. Stay posted. Stop. They weren't kidding. Got off the plane, made our way. Johannesburg, Durban, there were some other little towns in between. We do what's called government-sponsored uh, interviews. We're visiting the government-sponsored places where there's censorship. This is where the government-sponsored television, radio, everything's, quote, state-sponsored, government-sponsored. That means a lot of automatic weapons, a lot of pale faces, a whole lot of electric doors, and a whole lot of censorship. Once you've done the interview, then it has to go to the interview director of sub-interviews, which has to go to the person who's the sub-interview vice president of censorship. And little by little, it's deconstructed because this is a country now in 1978-79 which is really under the microscope. The whole idea of civil rights is really exploding there. Alex Van Halen and I decided we would go down. We're going to take a look for ourselves and unbeknownst to our guides and our interpreters who are very prim and proper. I mean, you know, with the librarian collar and this kind of thing with the glyph board. Welcome to government. <laughs> we walk inside, we do our interviews for 45 minutes and we're going to have to wait four days for them to go through the censorship. They're going to pick through it, make sure there's no innuendo, facade, that there's no subtext, that we're not politically oriented. And much to our credit, at the time, we were not. We talked to our guides and a lot of folks who were in their 20s, perhaps at that point in time, we were driving around having lunch and dinner in what was kind of like Mormon country. It looked a little bit like Salt Lake City in the 70s. Very square cut, very boring, very regular and predictable. And that was one of the times that just as our friends left the car to take a bathroom break or some such, I leaned across to our very African driver, I think his name was Milton or some such, very close to that. And I leaned across and I said, Milt, where do you get lunch? And he reached for the rear view mirror, you know the routine now. And he said, I missed up. I'm sorry, do you want me to do it with the accent? He said, missed up. Where I eat lunch, you cannot go. And I said, wow, we'll see about that. And the car had emptied out, and all we had was a little demure little government lady. She was like this, you know, with the bangs in her, and all like this, and very quiet and polite. And she had expected us to be quiet and polite because previously she had escorted somebody like Frank Sinatra or some of the guys from Toto or Tony Bennett's assistant or something like that. She expected Rodney King, can't we all get along? And as soon as the car emptied out, we just did a little bit of the old Brazilian jiu-jitsu and said, we're going to lunch. I'm sorry, I can't quite make out what you're saying. Your lips are moving, but it makes no sense at all. Al, is she making any sense at all? Hi, I'm the son of Satan. My duties now are largely ceremonial, but we're going to lunch. Milton, with glee, probably realizing that his job is already lost, drives us straight, no shit, into the Soweto Ghetto. The Soweto Ghetto. Watch the documentary, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. We drove right into the heart of that 40 years ago. 
And we had ourselves a time. We got the windows down. There are no pale faces anywhere. No more automatic weapons. It's as African as you could possibly get. Man, just turn that into a documentary color. We were in heaven. Alex and I, his father was a world traveler. My dad was stationed with the Air Force in Casablanca. And now we were part of the game too. And we went to lunch in Soweto. What we had was relatively familiar. You had some chicken, you had some rice, we had some seasoning and a lot of great cheer all the way around. Sort of the beginnings of like this, you had a lot of music. There's a stereo playing. True story, I wrote about part of this. But we were listening to the radio and everybody's got that teeny Motorola or some car stereo that's taken out of a car or the remains of a truck plugged into a Sears Die Hard or a Delco, and that's what runs your stereo. Familiar? Tom, do you know this kind of a stereo setup? In Central Park, for example, you literally get a car stereo, get being the preferred verb, and you put it in a wooden box or a cardboard box that holds the speakers, and you put that on top of a Sears Die Hard or a Delco or both, depending on how long you're going to be in a public place, and you put that on a hand cart like they wheel luggage in in a cheap hotel. I don't mean cheap. I mean like I don't stay at the Four Seasons. I stay at the Two Seasons. Do you have any kind of recollection of a mobile stereo unit like that at all? I do. Rec I recollect seeing that in my youth, yes. Okay. You carried a shoulder motor, right? A beat box. Did you have the kind of thing where you're going to roll it along where it was taken out of a vehicle and created to be used in a home or something? Yeah, in some sort of a wagon or some sort of a hand truck. There was always okay, something exactly. wheeling it. We had that in every garage, every handy shop, every restaurant, because we got out and we started walking. And these are dirt, dust streets. There's no sidewalk on most of it, and it's like bazaar, not bizarre, but B-A-Z-A-A-R. We're at the bazaar, mom, stop. It's Dave, stop. <laughs> We're having chicken, rice, and great fellowship in the middle of the Soweto ghetto, 1978, 79, right in the middle of the summer. I don't know why. It's always hot and sweaty, and I'm always ready. I don't know, nothing really happened in the snow. That's not true. See you at the next episode, Dress Warm. For right now, we're in the middle of Africa, and I'm listening to the Motorola, and we're finishing up lunch, and I said, what station is that? Because they're singing along with the records. They're kind of reciting poetry. They're reading from books. They're laughing, and clearly they're dancing because I heard somebody just hit the record player, and it skipped a little, and the other guy criticized him, and they're using really, really pigeon accents, all right? Where is that radio station broadcasting from? Because the Johannesburg state-sponsored radio station that we had just come from, Alex Van Halen and I, was under lock and key. That was restricted. Automatic weapons all the way around. Very, very serious-looking soldiers, all pale faces, okay? Nothing was done live. Nothing was done without censorship. Nothing was done without scrutiny. And we're finishing up in the middle of the Soweto ghetto, a great lunch, great, great time, great people making noise. I didn't understand half of what anybody sang, but that never held the audience up from having fun with me, so let's return the favor. Where do you think I learned this? You might not like what I say, but you love the way I say it. You might not understand anything I say, but same response. You love the way he says it. And we're having a great time. And I says, where's this radio station broadcasting from? And they laugh and they go, about 16 blocks that way. I said, what's the name of that station? And they go, Heidi, that's Swazi Radio. I'm sorry, do you want to hear about Swazi Radio? Here we go, fast motion, everybody rises from the seats. What an amazingly great idea that's come out of simply nowhere. Everybody runs outside, jumps into the cars, the Jeeps. We trundle it down. It's literally about four minutes this way down the dirt road. There's dust. Everybody's had a little too much to drink. This is allegations, but we have film. Everybody's laughing and joking and everything. And we come to what is called a magic store. 
This is like a pharmacy, but no pharmacy that you have ever seen outside of an Indian First Nation reservation. Everything is herbs and sages and bits and pieces and animal ear and this kind of a thing. And underneath, you hear music blaring from what sounds like ruptured speakers in a stereo. Believe me, I'm in the rock band Van Halen. I know the sound of ruptured speakers, all right? And you can hear it literally coming from the basement, which is always reserved for storage and so forth. And we're in literally where there are monkey bits and pieces <laughs> and dog serums that are with uh, chopped nuts and all kinds of wild jungle stuff. This is long before there's PETA, animal rights, save the rhinoceros and powders of insects and so forth. This is a magic store like out of the turn of the century. And it's a pharmacy for people who can't even spell pharmacy, much less afford to go to one. Again, you want to see where I was Go watch, go watch the Netflix documentary, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. I was right there. I felt like, whoa, I know exactly what that food smells like. It smells amazing, but even more amazing is the soundtrack. And Alex and I, remember who we are. We have virtually no business politically, morally, whateverly being there, but... I am Tarzan, I am ready to see the world. Alex Van Halen runs the drum line for one of the baddest bad boy clubs since the American Marines, the Van Halen Rock Band. We're like two drunks who won the lottery. You're not gonna convince us of anything ever again. There's no wristwatch anymore. <laughs> so we say, let's go downstairs and see Swazi Radio. They gotta know us. And we go down the stairs before anybody, our interpreter or anybody can say anything. This is a true story. And we go down the stairs into this sweaty, hot, windowless, airless basement. And there's four guys. They all look like they're playing for the NBA. Every single one of them is six foot six or tall. And they're dancing around one microphone that's right in the middle. Old school microphone like the one I started with early on in the Roth show, right? Go look back. One of those old, they're like from the 40s or something. There's one microphone. Microphone. There's a bunch of mismatched speakers from home stereo. Remember when home stereo speakers were about three feet tall and the wires are hanging and there's Christmas lights and no chairs. They're running the whole show, doing like this and making it happen and saying, one time, hi, blah, blah, and dancing and everything. And I swear to God, they went from Donna Summer to Michael Jackson, Bob Marley and the Wailers, and then Van Halen without blinking an eye. And then they would just dance over and turn the music down and start the interview. And when you got boring, they just turn the music back up and dance away. <laughs> and then come back and go, excuse me, brother, I want to ask you one question. No, wait, wait, for the chorus. And they turn it back up and everybody be down. I swear to God. And we spent four hours in that sweaty hot basement having a great time. Careful what you show your kids. That stuff could be for life. Yo, ah. to this day, I've never done a podcast or any kind of radio cast sitting down. There are no chairs right back here. I'm standing up right now. Go back, watch every single podcast that we've done, including when I did the Howard Stern gig, when Howard went stratospheric for Sirius XM. I held that fort down for almost five months before they fired me. I never touched ground, baby. The most civilized I got was I let him put it on a little piece of cardboard in case I start to break. Just kidding. Kind of. 